We are following growing questions about the federal judge overseeing one of the disgraced, twice impeached, four times indicted ex-presidents, many, many, many legal cases. And of course, we are talking about uh, the classified documents case involving allegations the former president hoarded highly classified documents in bathrooms and the ballroom down at Mar-a-Lago. And federal judge Aileen Cannon, the Trump-appointed lawyer, who came to this case with only three years on the bench and with very little experience in running criminal trials. Cannon, whose rulings in the case so far have repeatedly drawn scrutiny and rebukes and reversals by higher courts. And now Judge Cannon is under fire once again for what the Washington Post uh, diplomatically calls a, quote, unusual order regarding jury instructions. Quote, even though Cannon has not yet ruled on when the trial will be held or a host of other issues, she is skipping ahead to the very end to jury instructions, asking prosecutors and defense attorneys to consider two different hypothetical situations, writing in part, quote, in the first scenario, the jury would be allowed to review a former president's possession of a record and make a factual finding, whether it is personal or presidential, using the definition set forth in the Presidential Records Act. The second scenario is one in which a president has sole authority to categorize records as personal or presidential. And as the Washington Post points out, that second hypothetical would appear to be one in which Trump seemingly could not be convicted under almost any set of facts of improperly possessing classified documents. Now, for the non-lawyers in our audience, that is the legal version of tails you lose, heads I win. Or as the Daily Beast put it, Judge Cannon, quote, has forced prosecutors to make a stark choice, allow jurors to see a huge trove of national secrets or let him go. But as she has done repeatedly, Cannon used these otherwise innocuous legal steps as yet another way to swing the case wildly in favor of the man who appointed her while he was president. Quote, special counsel Jack Smith must now choose whether to allow jurors to pursue or peruse the many classified records found at the former president's South Florida mansion or give jurors instructions that would effectively order him, uh, order them to acquit him. It is a move so off the wall, it puts Judge Cannon squarely on earth too, as Nicole might say. But could it also get Judge Cannon actually removed from the case altogether? Ever since Judge Cannon's bizarre new order came down, calls for her removal have been growing by the hour. We're also following some late-breaking legal news in another case, this one, the question of presidential immunity, now before the Supreme Court. Within the last hour, Trump's lawyers filed their brief, arguing that, quote, no former or current president faced criminal charges for his official acts. And, quote, a denial of criminal immunity would incapacitate every future president with de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and condemn him to years of post-office trauma at the hands of political opponents. And with all that, that is where we start today with national investigative reporter for The Washington Post, Kara Lenig, plus former top official at the Department of Justice and MSNBC legal analyst, Andrew Weissman. And with me here on the set, MSNBC host and legal analyst, Katie Fang. It's great to have all three of you with us. Andrew, I'll start with you. You've had a moment to review this uh, filing that was just sent to the Supreme Court on the question of presidential immunity uh, by Team Trump. What stands out to you? So I think the quote that you have, which is clearly, you know, Donald Trump projection about if we don't have presidential immunity, we're going to have this sort of tit for tat going on where future former presidents will be subject to blackmail and extortion. You know, one quick response to that is we've been doing pretty well so far. Uh, you know, this is there hasn't been absolute presidential immunity so far and all has been well. Uh, you know, the reason we're in the situation we're in is because of Donald Trump's actions uh, where he has been charged with criminality before, during and after his presidency. Um, but I would like to note for folks a statement on page five of the brief that I thought was pretty uh, interesting. I'm going to quote it to you. It says that Donald Trump took the actions he did in connection with the January 6th criminal case, that the reason he took the actions he did with respect to uh, Georgia, with respect to the Department of Justice, all of the allegations about interfering with the election, he says it's based on, this is the quote, based on voluminous information 
available to President Trump in his official capacity that the election was tainted by extensive fraud and irregularities, unquote. So the problem with that is, so far, no one has seen that evidence. We have tons of information from the January 6th committee, from witnesses, including Donald Trump's own appointed officials, that that evidence does not exist. Uh, we have Donald Trump saying that he has irrefutable evidence. Remember, he was going to give a press conference where he was going to unveil that. He never gave that press conference. And now he is making an assertion to the Supreme Court of the United States that he took these actions based on voluminous information available to him. Nobody has seen that. And that's the kind of statement that you would hope that the justices in the Supreme Court would jump on to say, what is it? Um, because that that kind of language is something that, at least heretofore, you really don't get away with in the Supreme Court. So to that point, uh, Katie, the idea that somehow Donald Trump has information that his attorney general, Bill Barr, at the time said this election was not stolen, it was not rigged, there was no evidence of fraud, this had gone to multiple court proceedings, um, that somehow he's going to now magically whip up something to present to the Supreme Court that, hey, he was just doing this because it was his official role to make sure the elections were not stolen and they had integrity. It seems a, it seems a bit of a reach. Maybe... Peter Navarro took that amazing evidence with him when he <laughs> checked Mike himself Lindell is still sitting on into it. Who the knows? Federal Correctional Institution in Miami today. It's to Andrew's point. He and he very like I, I'm always such a fan of Andrew. He's so elegant. But what he was saying is this, right? Where is this evidence? Because not only has it been tested in other forums, judicial forums, and other lawsuits where nothing came of it, but this is where where is this evidence? You're, you're not supposed to wait until the last minute to say, look. I have all of this evidence, and I'm going to present it to you now. I, I'm troubled by the fact that lawyers, on behalf of Donald Trump, right. when I go back to this, yeah. that they're willing to put their bar, bar numbers, their names on briefs where they're making representations like that. That's another very concerning thing. But in the absence of this evidence, Eamon, what is the court left to do? You and I both know that I don't care how many justices have been appointed by Donald Trump on the Supreme Court. They're never going to say that absolute criminal immunity exists for a president. Why? Because it opens a can of worms that right. they would never be able to shut. That Pandora's box would wreak such havoc that we wouldn't have any type of semblance of democracy or a constitutional republic left. The thing that concerns me is this rubric, this new kind of fact analysis that they want to do on a case-by-case -case basis, on an act-by-act -act basis that they set forth beginning on page 8 of this brief. They want the trial court to get this case back. They want Chuck in to get this case all the way back mm. and to do a case-by-case, act-by-act analysis of whether or not what Trump did fell within the outer perimeter of his office. Right. At the same time, having Chuck in laboring under this misbelief that because he's president, his broad swath of presidential power allows him to do everything. Because they have to argue this in the alternative. That's what we call as lawyers. This is my position A. This is my plan W. You can't even say it's a plan B because it's so far-fetched. But if you're not going to find absolute immunity, judge Chuck in. You need to go and you need to do it on an act-by-act -act basis. Stop and think about how long this is going to take. We complain about delay. Right. Think about how long this is going to take. And then think about how inconsistent the results could be. You could be a judge. I could come and try to argue something. And then a judge, another judge could hear something else. And so it's just going to be chaos. But that's exactly what Trump wants, right. right? Total chaos agent that he is. He even wants to interfere and put that into our judicial system. Yeah, I was going to say he wins just by delaying this more and more and having more Layout. of these, yeah, these questions that yeah. you're talking about. Uh, Andrew, let's go back to the other top story that we've been discussing in this uh, dealing with Judge Cannon uh, and the documents case. Um, explain what these jury instructions mean. And if I'm understanding this correctly, she's actually putting Jack Smith in an untenable position here. Let jurors view class documents or basically give them instructions that would essentially acquit Trump because he would be able to claim all of these documents were either personal or he has the purview to decide what they are. Well, the reason this is so legally wrong is that the two options that she asked Jack Smith and Donald Trump to address both um, have the same faulty legal premise, which is that these documents can be de um, determined under the Presidential Records Act to be personal versus governmental documents. That, that alone is very questionable that a president has that unilateral power. 
But the, the real problem with both option A and option B is that the Presidential Records Act is irrelevant. The, the president, um, the former president, is not being charged with a violation of the Presidential Records Act. He's being charged with keeping classified information national defense information at Mar-a-Lago and obstruction of justice. That has nothing to do with the Presidential Records Act. So this is like saying, I'd like you to address um, uh, Jack Smith. I'd like you to address the jury um, charge with respect to whether um, and how the earth is flat. That's option A. And then in option B, I want you to address how um, the jury should consider how the earth is square. Um, both of those are absurd, um, and so they're legally just fundamentally wrong. There are a number of other things that are that are wrong with their two options. Um, and so the real issue here, the sort of big picture issue is, what is it going to take to tee up this case so that Jack Smith can get to the 11th Circuit? I think it is absolutely beyond question at this point that this judge is um, is both way too inexperienced for this case and has shown her partisanship. She has been reversed twice by the 11th Circuit in strong language, and she really didn't learn her lesson, and she has continued to do the same thing. This this order that came out yesterday is the kind of thing that I have never seen. I have never seen sort of something that's so completely off the wall, both legally and even the way it's presented. So the issue is sort of, is Jack Smith going to sort of figure out how to get this to the 11th Circuit and take his shot at both getting her reversed and getting her removed.